All right, it's so good to be back with you for day four of prayer and fasting. Hopefully you're not just praying, hopefully you're not just fasting, but you're praying and fasting. And I really hope that you're not just thinking about it. It's sort of like people's New Year's you know, workout and diet plan. They're on the think about it plan. I think about getting up in the morning and working out. I think about eating better. I think about all the benefits, but that's all it is, is just thinking about it. We need to move from thinking about it to acting on it. So if you have not jumped in to our 21 days of fasting and prayer yet, do it now. Start off with just one meal a day, move up to two meals, then bump up to three meals, go a couple days where you completely fast all solid and liquid foods. You know, still drink your water, of course, maybe even your coffee, but let's take some time to really press into the Lord. And that's what biblical fasting is. It's abstaining from food for spiritual purposes. And so that's what I'm challenging you for. Uh, we are day four. We're going all the way through January 28th. Now, I've been on here for a couple of days in a row. I put together a little uh, makeshift studio so I can just keep the word coming and bring to you uh, something that's going to encourage you and help you understand what the scripture says about fasting and prayer. It's not something that we do uh, sort of like a hunger strike to get God to move. Although the Bible does talk about God responding specifically because we fast. Now, we know God is always there. God can hear us at any time. But the Bible says specifically that he moves or responds because people fasted. And I want to walk you through some of that in the scripture today. One of the chapters in the Bible that talks quite a bit about fasting is in Isaiah chapter 58. Now, the people of Isaiah's time, they were very religious, very pious, and they had their traditions, they had their religious duties that they would fulfill, and they fasted often. They were uh, people who would give, and they would make offerings of sacrifice, and they would pray. And yet in Isaiah chapter 58, God comes in and he rebukes them. He says, that's not the type of fasting that I'm after. When you're fasting, you're still seeking your own pleasure, your own desires. You're being mean to people. You're withholding from them. There's a form of godliness, but there's no power that transforms you. And in chapter 58, verse 4, he says, Fasting like yours today will not make your voice to be heard on high. So God tells them, that kind of fasting won't cause me to listen. Although... He does say a little bit later on, as he describes what kind of fasting he is after, the results of fasting and how to fast, the benefits of it. He says in verse 9, that you will call and the Lord will answer, and you will cry and he will say, here I am. So God lays out to his people the way to fast, but also the benefit of fasting. And one of those benefits is when you call on the Lord, he says, here I am. There is a responsiveness of God that happens only through fasting and prayer. God could have said, don't worry about fasting. Just call out to me and I'll listen to you. And he does say that in other places. But right here, he's intentional to let him know there's a certain type of response you will get from me when you fast and pray. Fasting is intended to present our prayer up to God. It like uh, mounts up on wings of eagles, right? And fly, flies to heaven. It, it, it comes before God in a way that elicits a response. If you look at Ezra chapter 8, verse 23, he said this, So we fasted and implored our God for this, and he listened to our entreaty. So often when you see uh, the mention of people fasting in the scripture, then you also see the mention of God hearing and responding. So they're not just fasting to beat their body. They're not just fasting to humble themselves alone, though fasting does humble uh, somebody. It humbles yourself. But they're fasting so that God would hear. And in fact, fasting, it's part of seeking God wholeheartedly. So we know that we should worship and give our whole self to God. But fasting actually demonstrates that. It positions us that way. In Jeremiah 29, 13 and 14, he said, You will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations 
and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back from the place which I have sent you into exile. Listen to that. God is talking about when people seek him with their whole heart. He says, there's several things that happen when you seek me with your whole heart. Number one, you find me. You seek me, you're going to find me when you seek me with your whole heart. And then, when think about this. When you're seeking after God with your whole heart, you're often bringing your requests and your, your issues to him, the things that you desire, the things that you need. He says, I'm going to be found by you, declares the Lord. I'm going to restore your fortunes. So oftentimes, people have experienced just, they, they've been robbed by the enemy. And God is saying, I'm going to restore your fortunes to you. I'm going to gather you from all the nations where you've been scattered and the places where I've driven you. And I'll bring you back to the place where, from which I've sent you into exile. God's saying, I'm going to give you a home. I'm going to give you a place where you belong. I'm going to put you back in a secure place, a place of provision, a place of family, a place of belonging. These are some of the things that God says happens when we seek him with our whole heart. Now, I've been reading this great book called God's Chosen Fast. And one of the things he says in there on page 50, he says, When a person is willing to set aside legitimate appetites of the body and concentrate on the work of praying, he is demonstrating to God that he means business, that he is seeking with all his heart, and he will not let go until God answers. Joel Chapter 2, verse 12 says this, Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart. And then he describes what returning to God with all your heart looks like. With prayer, with, or with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. So there is the humility and the mourning over one's own brokenness that happens when you turn to God with your whole heart. There's this fasting. It humbles you. And God is saying, when you return to me with your whole heart, there will be fasting. There's going to be weeping. There's going to be mourning. So this is how we present ourselves before the Lord. And this is what I, I find happens quite often. When you're fasting, you will recognize things on the inside of you that cause you to mourn. You will uh, recognize things on the inside of you that are of the flesh that need to stop and you'll repent over them. You'll also find that there's times of weeping because you're allowing God into places of your life where there are some unhealed areas. And sometimes he wants to touch on something that causes weeping. And so all of this is part of search, uh, searching and seeking after God with our whole heart. And fasting sets the stage for that. Fasting coupled with prayer makes us like that persistent widow in Luke 18. You remember the story Jesus tells? And he said, there's a widow in a city who kept coming after this judge, um, continuously saying, give me justice against my adversary. If you know the story, the guy's like, man, I, I don't even want to listen to her. But because she keeps coming, I'm going to grant her request. Now, God is not that way towards us, but Jesus is telling us that we need to be that way towards God, to where we keep pounding on heaven's door and saying, God, I'm not going to back down. I'm serious about this. I am, I am setting myself apart to see the answer from heaven. So we have to be persistent. Not only that, we have to be persistent because we know that we have an adversary who is persistent. He's doing everything he can to stop us. He has no authority unless we give it to him. But sometimes because of our lack of passion, our lack of responsiveness, our lack of wholeheartedly seeking God, we leave opportunity for the enemy. The scripture even talks about this in several places and it, and it gives this picture of the courtroom of heaven. You remember in the book of Job, in, in chapter 1 and 2, verse 6 of 1 says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came. And you remember what they do? They accused Job. Chapter 2, verse 1, same thing. The sons of God, and what he's talking about here, uh, he's mentioning the angels, all the angelic hosts, all the spirit world. They all present themselves before God. Satan comes there too. And what does Satan do? He accuses. We see that same scenario happen in Zechariah chapter 3, verse 1. 
where he gets his vision. He says, Then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. So even as we come before the Lord, you know, the enemy is trying to come up against us. He's trying to accuse us. He's called the accuser of the brethren. He's doing everything he can to frustrate the plans and purposes of God in our lives. And so for us, this is where we, in fa fasting and prayer, become like that persistent person who is continuously going before God and saying, God, your word says, Lord God, this is what I'm agreeing with you on. I'm placing my faith and trust on you. Lord, you've already accomplished this. And there's some areas on earth that don't line up with your will on heaven. And so I'm calling for the answers. I want uh, the will of God to be done on earth in the same way that it is in heaven. The enemy is trying to say, no, we just like it the way it is on earth where uh, it's, bro it's a broken world, where the kingdom of heaven is not established, where I still have sway over people. But no, we're coming before God and we're, we're pointing out that adversary and we're commanding him to get his hands off of what God is doing in our lives. Fasting is what keeps the pressure on the enemy. It reminds him that I am not living for myself and my own desires. I am like what Matthew 11 says, in verse 12, it says, The kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. I am dying to myself to see victory. I am dying to myself to see the, the hand of God move. I am doing whatever it takes to pursue the Lord. And God has said that fasting and prayer is part of the believer's uh, work. It's part of our warfare. And we are people who advance the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. I see fasting as part of taking the kingdom by force. Now, it's not just that God hears us when we fast, but he actually hears us, and he grants us our request. So it's not just about getting an audience with God. I mean, that would be good in and of itself. But when we have requests that we're making to God, during times of fasting and prayer, the scripture tells us that God answers. So going back to Ezra in chapter 8, verse 21, here they are. They're traveling with a lot of people, some vulnerable people as well, and they have a lot of resources on them, silver, gold, all these things that God has provided. And Ezra says, hey, we need to stop for a second, and we need to seek the Lord to protect us on our trip. Look at verse 21. He says, Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river Ahava, that we might humble ourselves before our God to seek from him a safe journey for ourselves, our children, and our goods. So he recognized we're going on a trip. It's an important trip. We're advancing the kingdom of God. What we are doing will have eternal consequences. Let's not just go because of our good strategy or our good intentions. We don't even just want to step out knowing that God wants this too. We know God wants this to happen. But we're going to humble ourselves and say, God, unless you protect us and make it happen, it's not going to happen in our own strength. And so later on in verse 23, he said, So we fasted and implored our God for this, and he listened to our entreaty. And then verse 31, And the hand of God was on us, and he delivered us from the hand of our enemy and and from ambushes by the way. So we see the result of fasting and praying and humbling ourselves before the Lord is that God heard and he answered. So we're not just after God to hear our prayers and so we can walk away and say, yep, we prayed and God heard. But we're after God to hear and to answer and to see his will done uh, in our lives. And so we're praying according to his will. He's not the only one. Daniel in the book of Daniel, not the first chapter. Daniel didn't fast with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego by eating vegetables. That wasn't a, a Daniel fast. That was a Daniel diet, trying to follow a diet plan that honors God and doesn't um, get into you know the pagan way of eating and offering these foods to idols. But later on, it does say that he fasted. And he was fasting so that he could understand the prophetic timeline for, for that God had uh, for his people, and really to understand something written by the prophet Jeremiah. And so he refers back to that there. But God answers 
when he takes time to fast. So Jeremiah or Daniel had been in this situation where they're in bondage and he's saying, God, how long? And and I see that you wrote something about it and there's a timeline, but I don't understand it from scripture. So he set apart time to fast and pray and seek God. And God answered him. Could God have answered if he didn't fast? I'm sure he could have, but he didn't until Jeremiah fasted. We see Saul, who is later known as Paul, when he encountered Jesus, the, the Bible says that he became like blinded, so his eyes were open, but he couldn't see. And he did a total fast, no food, no liquids, for three days after that. And he had to be led around by the hand, so he had just had this miraculous encounter by with Jesus. And then Jesus went and talked to a guy named Ananias and said, Ananias, I need you to go and minister to Paul, and I'm, I'm going to tell him the things that he's going to suffer on my behalf. Uh, I'm laying out the calling I have for his life, but I need you to go and minister to him. And when Ananias did in Acts chapter 9, he, he showed up and he brought a, a prophetic word to Paul. He gave him some clarity of direction. He uh, prayed that he would be filled with the Holy Spirit. He ended up getting baptized in water. And the Bible says something like scales fell off his eyes and he was healed. So after this time of fasting and prayer, or I should say in his situation, we know at least that he was fasting and he encountered Jesus. He, he received a word from God. He was filled with the Spirit. He was baptized in water. And he was called into the ministry as a, a, after that time of fasting and prayer. And then the Bible says, so then he ate and he was strengthened after those three days. This is what I, I, I'm wondering. Maybe, maybe your healing, your breakthrough, your deliverance, your provision, the protection, the favor, maybe there's something significant that you want to happen in your life. And it's, it's as if it's right there um, waiting on you to wholeheartedly seek God by fasting and praying. I talk to people who live in chaos. They love the Lord. Occasionally they pray. Sometimes they read their Bible. They're faithful at church. They give. But there just seems like there's this wall that is keeping them in this place that just isn't God's best. And I think sometimes the solution is, hey, let's set everything aside and let's take the time to fast and to pray and to press into Jesus like never before. And let's see what God can do in just a short time. You can't fast uh, for a long time. You can fast for, you know, a few days. You can fast. Some people can fast for a couple weeks, do a long extended fast. Few people ever will fast 21 or 40 days of full, complete fasts. More people are starting to do it again. But sometimes your breakthrough, it's just a day or two. It really is. You fast and pray until you get that breakthrough and the Lord gives you a release. Let me know how your fast is going. I'd love to hear some stories, some testimonies, even some of your challenges with it. Uh, if you have any questions, let me know as well. Share these messages with people. Show up with us at church on Sunday at the gathering place. Anything we can do to get God's word on the inside of you, to see him show up in a big way, we want to be part of that. We love you. Can't wait to be back with you again tomorrow. I'm putting these messages together, just doing the best I can to encourage you on a daily basis.